They jitter. Yeah, you can't simulate stuff smaller than like a centimeter without it going nuts, so. <laughs> They've managed to nail the aesthetic of the original Avatar while also upgrading every single visual component that you can see. This is a basic screen effect. I'm gonna tell you how you do that shot right now. Time. This looks wetter than I've ever, and like that leather strap in there. <laughs> oh, you were about to say something hilarious. So wait, how do, how, do you, how do you like even render all that stuff? Today's episode is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Stick around to the end to see how you can get three months free when you sign up for a year. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Visual Effects Artists React. We are looking at some new stuff that you guys have been sending us like crazy over the last week. And of course, we are also joined by none other than the legend Ian Hubert. Thank you so much for joining us. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Good to do this French style. Hello! I'm, I'm Ian Huber here on Visual Effects Artist React. This is the best thing ever. This cushion smells like Adam Savage's butt. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! I like making films, kind of 2002 style of like green screen and consumer camera, but the tools have gotten so good over the past like 20 years that now doing that you can do kind of crazy stuff. I mean, I think you're underselling yourself a little bit. You've gotten very good at using this free software tool called Blender, and you are essentially a full-on movie studio by yourself. The thing I really like about your work, you're so close to the process the entire time. You know, you're shooting the shots, you're writing stuff, you're directing stuff. So like, there's this like so singularly focused world building aspect where like everything feels like it belongs. Before we jump into your stuff though, there's something we gotta take a look at. There's one thing that has been the talk of the town. Yes. It is called Avatar 2. Sam, I thought you made Avatar 2 a year ago. Yes, and suddenly it's all the rage. Like, let's see how Avatar 2 looked before James Cameron got his hands on it. <laughs> it's a Veter. A Veter 2. <laughs> what kind of thing is that? There's just so much going on in the <laughs> eyes. There's so much going on in the eyes. In this, <laughs> like the skin, like you can't get skin to look like that. No, you without can't. Without CG. Yeah. <laughs> I'm James Cameron. <laughs> What I hate is how good this is. Like, this is actually gorgeous. Yeah, it's pretty great, isn't it? You know, obviously I didn't have the team of storytellers and screenwriters that James Cameron had, so I had to rely on an AI to write this for me. The word Natsulu Sura is stenciled in it in Navi characters. <laughs> this is getting good. So after James Cameron saw my version of Avatar 2, he took some creative liberties and made a whole feature film out of it. Now, there's a little more water in it than I originally was intending, but the visual effects in it are, are quite good. I don't get this, but this trailer gets released and for some reason, all I see is just people arguing about this. I just heard people say it doesn't look good. Yeah, people are saying that this doesn't look good. They're saying the effects look dated. I think it's impossible to watch this too without thinking back to 2009. And I think thinking back could be kind of like altering the current perception of it too. Cause it's like, oh yeah, I saw this back like, 14 years ago, but like, no, you didn't. So I think what they have succeeded most so far is what you were saying. It's like, they've managed to nail the aesthetic of the original Avatar while also upgrading every single visual component that you can see. I like the close-up shots the most. It's all about like that lower eyelid where you have that like subsurface scattering going through that like pink lower eyelid. It looks so real. There is one shot in particular that we have to take a look at, and it is this one right here. Time. This looks wetter than I've ever, and like that leather strap in there. <laughs> oh, you were about to say something hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> this looks wetter than... This is wetter I... than any other CG water I've ever... <laughs> this is the wettest water <laughs> I've ever seen. <laughs> this shot right here, everything you're seeing from the, the blue skin to the water to the straps, everything you're seeing was generated by a computer. And we, I feel like we all, we're on the same page with that. Like we know this, right? Yeah. Yeah. So why does the internet refuse to believe that that shot is generated by a computer? I think because for the past like, you know, 15, 20 years of seeing a lot of CG water, we're always seeing it this scale, the wide scale. Yeah. Because that's actually fairly easy. And like we figured out how to do large scale simulations, but we never see like this micro stuff. Like if you look, there's one frame where it tugs and like that's displaced to the water splashing up outside of the saddle, mm -hmm. like in one frame. And we never see that type of like dramatic small scale stuff. It's a normal question. Why not just shoot that practically? 
why would you want to shoot a random close-up practical in this movie where almost everything else is CG? Just before you even look at the shot, just say, James Cameron made a movie with 99% CG <laughs> shots in it. And then and go, but one might be real. And you're like, The Lion King, the first shot's like an actual shot of, you know, a sunrise uh, yeah, in yeah. Africa. And then it's CG after that. There you go. That's an explanation, but not like a bootstrap. <laughs> the reason why you wouldn't shoot this practically is it really comes down to consistency. You know, you already have these super high fidelity 3D models of these blue alien 10 foot tall people. It doesn't really make sense to shoot them practically because you're going to get like a sort of mix up of scale. And it might also just look different from everything else that you're also putting in the movie. Second question, how do we know that this is CG? We know that the Navi person is CG because it's clear that that is not paint on the skin. That is actual CG skin. The only way, if you're gonna, let's say, do Navi makeup on someone and make it look this good, you basically have to like tattoo or like dye their skin. Yeah, actually, you'd have to tattoo them. Because when you put on paint, you're basically covering up all the actual characteristics of skin, so to speak. The light bounces off the paint versus going into your skin and then illuminating it as yeah. skin does, since it's slightly translucent. So then they're like, but the water, there's no possible way water simulations are that good. People are asking, why wouldn't you just like do a CG character in real water? And it's because water is mostly defined by what it's reflecting and what it's refracting. You'd have to paint out the original person from the reflection in every single wavelet, yeah. which is a huge thing. And also you have to paint out the refraction of like what's, and then what's left of the water. It's all just reflections it's, and refractions. There's nothing left. And then trying to put a different digital character in there Everything. with that same offsets is crazy. Yeah. Man. The bit that I think is nuts with this is the surface tension in the bottom left the way it goes into that woven oh, bit. Exactly. Yes, okay, There's yes. Surface tension. Like, I was gonna point out on the right. I don't remember ever seeing surface tension on that complex and dynamic of a scale. Like as the water goes away, it's still trapped there so, in the little bit. So I'm like, is this a 20 terabyte simulation or is, have they figured out some wacky stuff. Within this movie, there's like so many huge achievements that we're probably gonna be able to see or leaps forward with technology. Everything from like all the underwater filming they did, underwater mocap. They figured out how to do that. They like have ever, all the actors learn how to free dive and hold their breath for like 10 or 15 minutes. Can, Is that true? Yes, they're like, there's oh. like literally like insane things just from like an acting and mocap standpoint. Yeah. But then on top of that, from like a visual and rendering standpoint, there's like, I don't even know how many patents they've been making, but I've seen little blurbs pop up of like, oh cool, Wade has got like four or five new like water simulation patents for like really unique cases like this shot. I have their patent pulled up right here. Method for generating simulations of thin film interfaces for improved animation. What is this? Yeah, I think what it's doing is there's a two stage water simulation happening right here. Normally when you do a water sim, it's very particle based and they're doing that first particle sim for the water. But then when it actually like interfaces with something, I think what it's saying is that it's actually generating new particles at those actual surfaces. And that's kind of creating the illusion of that water tension that you're talking about. So basically they, it's, they figure out how to make stuff look really wet. <laughs> that's, I wanna... that's what it is. It's, it's the wet filter. Weta is famous for literally inventing tools from scratch in order to make their movies. Remember back when like massive armies weren't a thing? And then Peter Jackson was like, I want an army. I want 10,000 people. But they also pioneered the whole animation pipeline for creatures. So it does not surprise me that they are making even more strides with brand new tools for the water stuff. We open this with the idea that there's like people arguing on the internet about it. But frankly, I think it's just a few people with loud voices. I think most people who saw this were like, this is dope. And I, you know, I think that, you know, cause it's pretty obvious. You know what? I think it's time for you to pull the trigger and hit that subscribe button. Look, if we hit 100% subscribers, we'll shut up. But until then, we have to keep saying this stuff because YouTube demands it. I would be remiss if we did not actually look at some of your incredible films that you've put out with you here on the couch right now. We had you in before, long distance, but we see it together Let's now. look at it right after the Avatar 2 trailer. <laughs> That's gonna really make it shine. <laughs> I like how your stuff always opens with like a fisheye lens. I've gone so hard into fisheye on the recent stuff. stuff. Yeah, I know. It's nice. It's a nice touch. The sheer amount of detail you get in the texture work has always blown me away. 
Did you hand model each of those jet engines? I modeled a lot of different pieces. I made a little library of stuff. And yeah, I kind of have one jet engine and I would wrap it in different things. And you can see they're kind of the same. Like I mixed and matched a little bit, but they're mostly just the same over and over because those aren't the main details you're looking at. And so it's like, all right, that illusion of crazy detail. This shot right here, if you look at the connections between like the foot and the panel in the back, all those linkages are an IK chain. And so I'm just trying to show off where I actually do have detail and <laughs> distract from the places where I don't. That's a great shot. It's, it's an incredible shot. The popcorn machine, I think, is a great example. Look at that, like, dank. We're back to the moistness, you know, like. The reason, though, there's a big, cool popcorn bot in the foreground is because I'm trying to distract you from the janky people right behind it. And that's the whole deal. <laughs> oh, you're right. Those are super janky. Yeah, so everybody's looking at the popcorn look at robot because I know how to do robots. <laughs> Wait, how, how do you how do you like even render all that stuff? <laughs> I mean, I mean, like I just look, you know, I just look at the complexity here, and it's like, do your project files even work? It's all hand modeled, and because I learned modeling in the '90s, where you get you know a thousand polygons in there, and your computer slows to a chug. But in general, it's low poly stuff with image textures on there, kind of like trying to sell the texture. So like the ground there and the walls. Very low poly. Those are, yeah, those are low polygon surfaces, but high detail image textures on top of them, kind of giving the illusion of a lot more detail. And because of the motion blur, they're not even high resolution textures. <laughs> and again, I'm putting in all of these lights passing by to like add to the sense of speed, but yeah. also to make it so you never really get to look at anything properly. It's all psychological. Basically, before somebody can fully appreciate the thing, you whip away so that they're like, oh, there's too much to experience. And it's like, yeah, because you only had a quarter of a second to look at it. They jitter. Jitteros. Sorry, hold on. Whoa, uh, hype jittering? It's, I, it's is that the best CG <laughs> joke ever. It is the best CG joke. Is that just the worst <laughs> physics sim? Yeah. yeah, you can't simulate stuff smaller than like a centimeter without it going nuts, so. <laughs> Because this is an actual thing, like if you get, like these things, and sometimes th like they just they jitter. They don't stop. And you incorporated that into the thing <laughs> by making a joke. The reason why I love this is because it's like a triple entendre. You got the hyperbole, it's a hyperbole, and then you got a hyperbole, the cereal. It's hyperbole, hyperbole. <laughs> Let's wind the clock back a little more. 1924. Okay, 98 years ago. All right, everyone, you're struggling to make a video. <laughs> 98, 98 years ago, they had it all figured this out. This is the third film ever made. Dude. All right. So this is dub obviously double exposure. Yeah. But he's see-through. Why isn't the guy on the right see-through? If it's double exposure, he's see-through. You double expose it. But when he gets up, that should also be revealing the environment that he just left. Yeah. See, now the problem is, is that these guys are 50% of passing. See, they're also see-through. <laughs> see how they're see-through too now? Yeah. See, that's the problem. I'm going to tell you how you do that shot right now. This is a basic screen effect. You're on a set. What we're seeing here is basically he's sitting on a stool and when they get the second take of him waking up, they turn off some lights, they move the walls back, they clear it, and they probably even just put like some black felt over that stool. You can see the felt fade in. On the left, it looks like cobwebs and like around the safe and like that's just the curved black velvet oh, that they put over yes. the set. Oh, they so they put, wouldn't they, be exposing the background. Yes, twice. they just put fabric over everything. Yeah, that's, yeah exactly. Because this is a double exposure, they're doing this on the same exact original film, and so anything that is bright enough to expose the film will be seen again. It's like the original OG way to do green screening, except it was just pure brightness values. Wait, I thought that was... No, that's just a real set there, Dad. That was a real set? I thought that was a picture-in-picture -picture type deal with like a freaking matted out double exposure <laughs> type type thing. Which is where I love this old stuff just because like so much of it is so obvious, but it's just so well done. That was a classic hard cut. And they just swapped out the sets as everybody tried to stay still. All right, let's see, let's see, let's see. So the tell here usually is watch the specific position of the audience. Yeah, they do. Wait a second, though. Hold on. That's now. not the set, though. That's that's like a composite, though. This is probably something where they have to expose this later. Was it more common in what 1924 for them to just do this in camera, or was this something that they were doing but back at like a like a film lab? Because if you were to do this in camera, think about the process. You film your opera scene with a black area there, 
And then basically you hike out to a mountain with a film reel full of people at this theater. Oh, I see what you're saying. And I bet you're totally right. And then you somehow mat off your footage in camera to line up with that. That doesn't seem very practical. This might be a thing where we need to call in an expert. Let's use our lifeline, okay? <laughs> Nico! Hey, Nico, can you hear us? Help! Nico! Nico! Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it works! <laughs> Buster Keaton, we need you a bust a fact. We just don't know the specifics of how would they have composited two different elements, because they're compositing like a movie into this theater. So I'm gonna guess that this is a two pieces of film layered on top of each other in the editing bay. The use of the heavy black border around the staging area, it lends itself to then just blacking out the entire thing and having a chunk of unexposed film. You can stick another piece of film on top of it and just shoot through both of them onto a final piece of film. It's not that they're double exposing the film, they're taking two sets of film and exposing a third set of film. The reason I'm gonna suggest that is because of how much more contrasty the background becomes. Yeah, See how okay. it gets really dark and like, the blacks get really mushed. If they just did a second exposure on it, the background like dark elements should stay normal. It should look nice. You know, it's not being double exposed through another set of film. That's and really that's sad. why now that it's a yeah, practical yeah. set, we get those black levels back. So technically this is not a double exposure. This is a optical printed stack in my guess. It's a double exposure and everything else should still look nice. And then you just have the exposure in the center. I mean, the problem solving that just had to exist back in the day in order to achieve this stuff is nuts. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't a cut. They were moving continuously the whole time that happened. Are you sure there wasn't a cut? I mean, let's watch him. That is a match cut. Boom. There I it is. I, no, that perfect. wasn't a cut. Those they're guys were still in motion. Aligned. The exposure jumps. There's a bump in the exposure. But like, yeah, see, there's that? a cut. There's a cut. Watch the guy on the right. The guy on the left is still moving at that moment, though. Like his arms are swinging perfectly into position. I think he's up. I, think I was going to say the same the thing. Hole. Yeah, he's jumping through, and you can see he's laying him just down, swing in into the costume. I think he's like laying down on like a diving board type thing, and he pops in. And right then as there. soon as he goes through, his body comes down, and his arms are there too. And so it's like his arm and his head are there, but his body is going out backwards. So, he's just laying so that's how the fence. he can get through there, and then he comes in. That doesn't mean that there can't be a jump cut though. I just matching the arm movement would be, they've not demonstrated that they can do that particularly well. I think you're right. I think there's a really fancy practical thing happening. I think there's a little bit of editing happening on top. And of notice how he reaches back around and like holds the dress together behind him as he walks away. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that's totally it. <laughs> and he wouldn't need to do that if there's just a match cut. I remember watching this as like a teenager and just being like, how did they do that? You know what, I take it back. There might be a small cut in there, but for all intents and purposes, this is done practically. Was this during when they were manual cranking? So could they have slowed down the cranking for just right then to help the effect happen and then they speed it back up? But if it was a slower crank, it wouldn't that create a more it exposure, which exposure would explain burst, the yeah. exposure bump? So it like, might be right. Dude, to be so good at cranking, just be like, and go. <laughs> and just like right into it smoothly again. Wait, Nico, you had something else you wanted to show, right? Yeah, so one of the things of my little guest appearance here in this episode is uh, so this new Kendrick Lamar music video dropped with an insane deep fake, and we got a ton of requests to talk about it. Unfortunately, we can't talk about the music video on YouTube because then immediately the channel gets copyright stricken. Copyright strucken? I don't know. So yeah, it's on our website, quarterdigital.com. I will delve into this and break it down for you there if you want to check it out. All right, well, that's all I have to say about that. Sam, you can stop hiding behind the couch now. <laughs> all right, see you guys. You may have seen a lot of amazing things on this show, but one thing you haven't seen is what's about to happen right now. That's right. Courtesy of today's sponsor, ExpressVPN, I will be riding this child's bicycle while also telling you about the wonders of how to protect your internet data. Let's get started. You see, the first thing you've got to know is when your data is out on the open internet, it's, it's not exactly that safe. It's susceptible to hackers, third-party advertisers, either buying or buying or stealing your information, and that's really not good. And a VPN provides an additional layer of encryption so that your data is protected as it's out on the open internet. The best part is that through using a VPN, like ExpressVPN, you can get content that might not otherwise be available in your country or region. How does that work, Jake? Well, it's actually very simple. You see, a VPN tells the open internet that you're accessing the internet from an entirely different location, which allows you to access content on, say, Netflix, 
that's available in England and not in the United States. That means that you can get things like, oh, I don't know, the entire Studio Ghibli library, which isn't available on Netflix US, but is available in other countries just by using ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN has been rated number one VPN service by Forbes and TechRadar, and they have servers in over 94 countries. Anyways, if you guys are interested in getting ExpressVPN for yourself and getting three months free of that service, all you have to do is click the link in the description below or go to expressvpn.com slash corridor crew. That's right, just click the link in the description below or go to expressvpn.com slash corridor crew to see how you can get three months free when you sign up for a year. You're probably thanking me right now, so you're welcome. See you later. Ta and ta. Toodaloo. Hey, if there's some cool wet clips you want us to check out, let us know in the comments below. I feel like we missed some moist clips. Dude, it, it can get wetter here. Wetta. Wetta. Wet, oh my <laughs> wet, God. Uh, wetta <laughs> with the wettest effects. <laughs> All right. This was actually a huge amount of fun. Ian, I have been looking forward to having you on the couch for literally years. I have been looking forward to it also. Matching your energy again. Okay, great. <laughs> You have a YouTube channel, you have a Patreon. People can go check out your stuff right now. Everything I've put up for the past few years has been on my Patreon, where I literally explain, break all of this down, uh, little tutorials. Yeah, go watch the stuff. There's links everywhere. They're in the description. They're up and down, they're in the screen. Hey, thanks everyone for watching. Don't forget to smash that like button and hit subscribe on Ian's YouTube channel. And uh, we'll see you guys in the next episode.